Welcome, everybody, to the Salty Yak Podcast, where we talk saltwater kayak fishing most of the time. Oh, my God! Did you see that? Did you see him come up there and get that thing? That might have been better than sex. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, shit. was a big old flounder. No, Kevin, we can't keep it. We gotta let it go. Oh, come on, Gary. Gotta be a redfish in here somewhere, right? Oh my god. Oh my god. Woo <laughs> You just pull a pair in between us and catch one. You little pot licker. Go kayaking. It'll be fun. Hey, welcome back everybody to the Salty Act Podcast. Whether you're a new listener or you're an old salt, I have got something super interesting for y'all today welcome dr mark stanley thank you so uh some of y'all might know who mark is and uh some of you probably won't but by the time we get done with this podcast i guarantee you will and uh, you will find him just as interesting and entertaining as i do what do you think about that uh, happy to be here <laughs> real real honor so let's start off with uh let's get everybody to get to know you just a little bit better okay so what i'm going to do here is so we're going to be talking about a book today we're going to talk about several books today probably that mark has wrote and so this is off the back of one of the covers of his of his books mark stanley is a is a water anthropologist he admires kayak fishing and innovation anywhere but especially in alaska and he is a native Texan where he has spent years researching watercraft design, culture, and uses. He built his first kayak at age 16. You built your own, your first kayak? Well, my tennis coach was a real master builder, so he yeah. helped me build one, wood and canvas. So with the help of his British boat builder, who's the your, tennis, your coach. tennis coach, yeah. He's a lead tinker in the t- tinkerer in the Texas kayak repair and innovation. He also spends time at Alaska kayak fishing kayak repair and he has a fishing business on prince of wales island in alaska so uh the other part of your little bio that i found very interesting is you were an english teacher in korea for the peace corps so that would have been how long ago was that oh many many moons as they say (laughs) but it was kind of i went to school in uh, san marcos at what was then southwest texas Uh lived on the blanco river in wimberley and decided to try the Peace Corps, so went overseas and spent two years as a Peace Corps volunteer. Liked it so much, I spent a third year working for the embassy. So you're working for the U.S. Embassy in Korea. Yeah, and so. So you were teach, but you told me you were teaching English in a small Korean village. Yes, sir. As part of the Peace Corps uh-huh. work, I got to teach English in a little mountain village for two years and learn to love kimchi and the Korean language. I think the most unique experience, of course, growing up in Texas is all of a sudden I was in a village of about 10,000 people and I was the only one that spoke English. Everybody else spoke Korean. So I had a, a, what do they call that, a steep learning curve? Yeah. So, you know, we were talking about off air. I've been to Korea four times. I told you I I loved Korea so much, I volunteered for mess duty when I was in the Marines to go back to Korea. So uh, I just was an amazing place. And we got to spend some time out in the field you know, and see the countryside and the people that lived out there. And uh, it was just an amazing place. Yeah, I was just uh, talking with our father, who's 93, who was a Marine Corps, a, a corpsman as well. And he was in uh, North Korea uh, right after the war and had a run-in trying to rescue two Navy pilots. So I was hearing his story yesterday. So it's funny to have a father who was Marine Corps and mm-hmm. then for me to get to go over there in the Peace Corps. Yeah, that's... So, uh, part of a family tradition that's amazing of course two totally different times so but it but still just to be able to go there and do that so let's talk a little bit about how you and i met so we have everybody knows we have the salty yak pack if you don't know go on facebook find us the salty yak pack you got to answer some questions to get in the group but we're we're you know we're a kayak kayak fishing group so you joined the salty yak pack and we were doing a matagorda island trip and you reached out to me and said, hey, I want to go on the trip. I did. I, I You had talked about the trips the two years previous and where you had had some luck and not so much luck. Mm-hmm. But I thought this year was interesting because you really didn't know how many people were going to show up. Yeah. You know, it was like, is it going to be three or four? And what did you end up having, like 
20? 22. Wow. Counting, counting the guy who, our mothership. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And so, it was incredible. Yeah, 21 kayakers, counting yourself. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I knew nothing about Mark. I didn't do any research on Mark. He was just another kayak angler that wanted to come on the kayak trip. So we pull up to the boat ramp there at Port O'Connor Fishing Center, and Mark's here unloading his stuff. And the first thing I notice about you is you have Alaskan license plates on your vehicle. And so I tried to get Mark it, the first evening. And we, we, we tried to get Mark to tell us more about his uh, Alaskan license plates and how an Alaskan came all the way down to Texas. But he seemed to dodge the subject. He never <laughs> really would give us an answer. And being uh, there's three or four of us that were police officers there, you know, we obviously became skeptical and started thinking, you know, so why would an Alaskan come all the way down to Texas and all this? But I didn't know the backstory that you're from Texas and you just have spent many years in Alaska. So all true. I think it, I'm always cautious to talk to Texans about Alaska. <laughs> I mean, I've got stories about Texans and Alaskans. And uh, every time my family's all here in Houston, Beaumont, Austin, et cetera. And every time I start talking about Alaska, their eyes just roll up and we don't want to hear about Alaska. Oh, no. I, 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 you know, we've had the conversation before. I want to go. It's a, it's on the bucket list. I want to go. I want to go to Alaska. And after meeting you, I want to go kayak fishing in Alaska. So we meet there at Port O'Connor. We all paddle out to the, to the island and Mark's there, and you know we're, we're all in get, you know ha- hanging around dinner, hanging around the campfire, and we're talking with Mark, and he's being a little hesitant about wanting to talk about Alaska, and so the next day Mark goes off on a trek where he walks over to the lighthouse. It's like three and a half miles away. Incredible. And somebody was talking about, well, where did Mark go? Where did Mark go? <laughs> and uh, I don't remember who it was, but it was one of the police officers said that. Uh, well, you know he's probably the serial killer that's going to kill us all, and he's out there digging twenty-one graves. <laughs> so that was kind of a little side, inside side joke. Later, is because we didn't know anything about you. We just made up our own story, which it turned out that you were the serial, the serial killer. <laughs> so, Cheerios, Cheerios, Cheerios. So, uh, what did you think about the Matagorda trip? Uh, on several levels, it was just the best. Um, I think I would back up and say what. I enjoy most is learning, researching, learning. And if you really think about it, if you're a kayak angler, where do you get to go learn? You buy a boat, you buy gear, you go out and hopefully you don't get killed on your first time out. And then you find a buddy or two and you learn a little bit more, but it's a very steep learning curve on becoming proficient. Mm -hmm. So what you created at Matagorda and that trip was like an academy. And I just couldn't believe the opportunity to get to go learn massively over a weekend with 21 other people and so uh, that's what motivated me yeah it was a it's always a fun trip and that's why we're here because we're going to talk about learning to be a better kayaker and be a better fisherman that's the whole the whole point of the podcast and your book that we're going to talk about but it's just a fun trip and you get to really know people when you go on a trip like that and uh so far so you know, so good. We hadn't ran into a serial killer. We all made it back alive. So, um, well, and let me just color that picture a little bit more. Y'all are so damn expert that I was intimidated by all the expertise that was there with the 21 other people. And so part of what I found I had the most fun with was just talking to individual members. And so I got to know several people pretty well just by asking a lot of questions about how they'd been doing it and et cetera. And so, I think the opportunity of Matagorda was not only to see the island, which is remarkably unique, special, cool place, hard to get to, mm-hmm. but also the people that were there and the people that came along and joined us. They're just incredible experience and stories from them as well. So I, for me, it was the people as well as the place. You asked me a question after we uh, did the trip of uh, why do I think people come on the trip? And I pondered that for a while, and I really think – you mentioned it's hard to get to. Not everybody wants to paddle a kayak nine miles out there <laughs> and, and camp for two days with no electricity, really no amenities, no bathroom. Rattlesnakes. And rattlesnakes and everything else. Not everybody wants to do that. But there is a sense of adventure in that. And I think that's something that a lot of us look for, especially kayakers. When you get into this, I think they're adventurous people. Because not everybody wants to do this. 
But I think that people that go on that trip are looking for uh, an adventure in their life, looking, you know, the camaraderie of, of the group. I think that, you know, the fishing and, and everything else just is just a plus. But I think that's there's a lot of people out there that look for that in their lives. I think just to add to that, too, you know, why do people buy kayaks versus bass boats? And I have a little lake house up on Toledo Bend with my little brother. And when you go up there, you see all the guys with the bass gear, mm-hmm. the bass boats, the mega buck boats. And they're out there to catch fish. And good for them. That's what they mm-hmm. enjoy. But to your point, I think kayakers are a little bit different in that we're more interested in the fish and the adventure, getting the fish. And so if I can go out and slave a bunch of fish, then good for me. But if I can go out and have an adventure and slave some fish, then I'm really in my happy place. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Why do people buy kayaks? You know, some people, you know, they're tired of fishing on the bank, so they can't afford a boat, so they're going to get a kayak. <laughs> Or people like me, you know, I could I could have a boat if I want one, but I prefer the the solitude and the it's a solitude and com- com- camaraderie. Because when we're all in a boat, if so, you're driving the boat, you could decide where we go. But if we're all kayak fishing together, we're all together. We might not fish in everybody's back pocket, but I'm getting control of my kayak and I can fish where I want. You can fish where you want and fish the way that you want. But then we still come together and you know and share that whole experience as a group. So uh, no, that's complete, what I love about it. I completely agree. I, I, in the book, I talk about you know kayaking is both a single and a social experience. Yes. And part of what I like about kayaks is uh, my time in Alaska when I was I went up there to do an archaeological project funded by National Geographic, and I stayed on to go to graduate school at University of Alaska Fairbanks. And what I studied during those five years were native watercraft. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the history and the prehistory and the pre-prehistory of kayaking, to get to your point, you know, why did the first native make a kayak? And it turns out it wasn't a kayak. It was something else. Mm -hmm. We have theories because there's no archaeological record. But if you go way back, you know, a good six, eight thousand years, kayak, I argue in the book, is one of the oldest ongoing sports and subsistence tools that humans have ever created. Can was the kayak created in that area of the world? Well, quick answer is we don't know because you've got a long tradition of kayaking in Greenland. Mm-hmm. Um, there's many books that say yes, it was all created in Siberia and Alaska, but these are just guys with the uh, what's the word you know guessing as okay. to how it all happened. Archaeologically, wood and skin. Uh, gets chewed up by the soil and as an archaeologist i can appreciate that there is no archaeological signature of early watercraft and so another interview i'm working on another book right now about that history of Mm -hmm. you know people sitting on water but probably it was a very expedient tool it was getting a, a driftwood and carving out the driftwood or putting pieces of wood together around a skin uh, if you go to India, you, you know, you see the coracles, the little mm-hmm. round circular boats with a skin on the bottom of it. I've seen pictures from a Danish archaeologist who did work up in Alaska in the 50s of just a couple that would walk up the river with their dogs, uh, kill a moose, take the skin of the moose, put a bunch of willow branches to make a kind of a bathtub-shaped boat, put the meat of the moose in it, and then float it down the river. Wow. And that's, so you'd say, where did kayak start? It's just hard to know. It's hard to know. But we do know, there's no question that the Aleuts and the Aleutian Islands were like the NASA of kayaks. They were so far ahead of everybody. And I, in the book, I quote the, the Russian bishop from that area, and he said, nature did a good thing to the Aleuts. He said it gave them the idea for building kayaks, they're called badarkas, but he didn't give them any wood. <laughs> Because they don't have trees on the Aleutian Islands, so these Aleuts would take driftwood and make these highly, highly beautiful kayaks, highly functional, out in the uh, Bering Sea in the North Pacific. And that's how they learned to innovate, because they didn't have a lot of wood to play with. So we, we share other some other common interests, fishing, kayaks, and just in one of our conversations, we talked about cycling. And uh, you have a book on that, too. Yeah, I I, um, I think in the end, I'm just a very curious person. So um, I've, I've biked, when I got done with Peace Corps, I bought a little $5 Korean bicycle and uh, biked from 
Seoul to Tokyo. It took about six weeks. And then I biked. To Tokyo? Yeah. yeah. That other country next to Japan. How did you get across the water? On um, your kayak? I, I was swim. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's actually, it's a, um, so yeah, there's a ferry that goes okay, from yeah. Busan to Shimonoseki. Yeah. And, uh, but I just have loved biking. And so, um, did the big island a couple of times. That's a great place to go bike riding. And then up in Alaska, just last summer, the friend and I on the cover of the book were uh, up above the Arctic Circle doing some biking. He's writing a book about biking in Alaska and et cetera. But, um, I, just to paraphrase Matt Damon in the movie, The Martian. Mm-hmm. I just pick up a subject like biking or drones or kayaking, and I just like to research the snot out of it. So you mentioned the Big Island, and I know that to be the Big Island of Hawaii. Correct. So uh, you know I've spent some time in Hawaii, too. I didn't know that. Where? I, was, I was stationed in Hawaii nope. at Kaneohe Bay. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I've spent a lot of time on the Big Island. Yeah. So uh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So let's. we haven't even mentioned the name of the book yet. So the book we're talking about is... Fishing on Kayaks, a book of questions, correct? Correct. So uh, this book, uh, Mark came on the uh, the Matagorda Island trip. I didn't know he was an author. I didn't know you had a kayak book. I did not know the Salty Yak Pack or the Salty Yak podcast was mentioned in your book. Absolutely. So Mark did a great thing. Everybody who was on the, uh, the Matagorda Island trip, if you wanted a copy of his book, he gave a free copy of his book to everybody on that wanted one on the uh, the Matagorda Island trip. So I got a free book, and then I, I'd bought a book before then. So I wanted, you know, found it interesting, and I wanted to to, to know more about it. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about the book right now. So absolutely, positively love it. If you are a new kayaker, even if you're a seasoned kayaker. Uh, if you think you're about buying a kayak, you should read this book before you before you certainly buy a kayak. If you've already got one, uh, you need to read it because it is it's not a book in the aspect that I think of a of a book, right? It is a book, but it is more of you know, like you said, it gets you to think, right? Well, uh, just to pick up on that. Um when I moved back to Texas about six years ago, I got I wanted to do more with kayak, so I took a job with Austin Canoe and Kayak in San Marcos, mm-hmm. uh, repairing boats, you know, and talking to people, and just customers would come in, they'd say, I want to buy a kayak, and, you know, you can tell them what to think, or you can ask them questions. I think you do a great job of this with the podcast and how you interact with your guests. You can ask them questions and say, well, are you interested in... Uh, fishing on the the ocean, the river, or the lake. You know, there's just so many, there's a series of questions that people who are thinking about kayaking should be asking themselves. All I did was sort of organize those questions across 15 topics like safety, navigation, kayak gear, et cetera. Gave a little bit of content about that topic, navigation, safety, gear, et cetera. But then I also put the best questions that I could think of And then I talked to a bunch of buddies and got their questions. So that's what the book's about. It's really the premise is that the question is the answer. So let me read the back cover of the book to y'all. So are you ready for fishing on a kayak? And how can you know? Do you have all the right gear, kayak, fishing tackle, clothes, first aid, safety skills, food and water, mindset and navigation skills? Have you considered starting with a guide? Fishing on Kayaks, Books of Questions is designed to help you answer those questions before your next trip. You'll find basic information on the 15 topics, thoughtful questions to be asking yourself, links to YouTube, web resources, references to the books, videos, films, and social media, all focused on this sport. And each resource is linked using a QR code so you can read and watch from your smartphone or tablet. Remember, the question is the answer, so be prepared to read, listen, and ask, and learn as you create your own fishing on a kayak skills and experiences unique using this unique book. I love the QR code. I never would have thought about it. So you can use your phone. He's got the QR codes in the book talking about whatever topic with the resource. And, yeah, talk about that. Well, actually, it came from the bicycling book. My friend Dave Plaskin and I... Uh, we're up in Alaska last summer. He was he's researching his book on biking in Alaska, and his son 
said, uh, Dad, you guys should be using QR codes in the book so people could immediately go to that YouTube video or to that website. So we got the idea from my friend Dave's son, Tate. Mm -hmm. And so then I've just applied it to my drone book, the biking book, and then now the kayak book. And um, I've been, the REI's been buying this book. So I've, they're in the Houston downtown okay. store. I just sold them in Florida. They're in the Gainesville and Orlando store. And the managers at REI said, this is perfect. Because now our customers can get the book, read and get the questions. But if they want to find out more about it, they can just plug it in, like you said, to their phone and go watch that YouTube video from REI or Austin Canoe and Kayak or other. When one of those places sells a kayak, they ought to hand them this book. They really should. Thanks. They should hand them this book and say, Here, here's the guide to go along to get you ready to go on your first kayak fishing experience could, could completely agree and let, let me color that just because i, I like i said I, I like researching and when i decided okay i want to write a book about kayak fishing i went and purchased borrowed or stole not not stole <laughs> all of the kayak fishing books that are out there mm -hmm. there's about 27 of them right now and they're beautifully done but they all tell me what to do mm -hmm. they tell me what to think they tell me tell me tell me and i don't know about you but i'm just Texan enough. I don't like to be told what to do. I like to be suggested, herded, guided, but I don't like to be told what to do. So my approach in the book is just as you've picked up on it. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you that you ought to be asking yourself some questions. Yeah. And I get it all the time from the social media thing. People, you know, sending me a message that what do you, you know, what life jacket should I be using? What kayak should I buy? You know, it's all in, that just leads to, like you said, more questions because I need I need more information if I'm going to answer that question for you. Exactly. So it just leads to questions, which this book, you know, the book of questions. I love the way. Now, when I say it's a book, I'm holding it in my hand here. It's a nice little paperback, um, about a hundred pages. About a hundred pages. Just it's not a, it's not a long read, so uh, you don't have to worry about that. But the way that it's set up, there's the nice little card. Oh, that I sent you saying thank you for Matagorda. Yeah. Hang on to that. But the way this thing is set up, it's almost what it reminds me of is like a workbook because you leave where the questions are. There are places that people to write in their answers, you know? So they, this is not only just a book, it's a guide for you to come up with what works for you and what works best for you and for you to think about it. Agreed. And the part of, let me um, add more to that because when I think about workbook, I think about simplistic questions mm -hmm. that once I answer, I'm done. I don't have to think anymore. But my most of my career, I've been an educator up in Alaska. I was a teacher, principal, assistant, superintendent, professor at the university. And in education, just to use a $2 word, the pedagogy that we care about, how we teach, how we think about how we teach, the, probably the most powerful, what every educator hopes they can do is what's called inquiry-based learning. Mm-hmm. So that we get students guiding their learning by asking them, asking students to ask their own questions. So inquiry. So all of these books are geared for workshops or, like you said, asking your own question. But in the end, from an educational perspective, it's all about inquiry. What do I know about kayaking? What do I, what do I don't know? And how do I go find out more about it? And that's, that's how I've written these books. Just with that in mind. I mean, so we're... You, just looking at some of the, the table of contents here, looking back and looking forward. That's kind of what we talked about, you know. Where do kayaks come from and where are we going? Can I, let me, I, I, Go to me, that's that's what my next book I'm working on right now is that history. But to me, what's so cool about kayaking, name me another sport that's been around at least five to 8,000 years that people are continuously doing it. And all the people that go to Walmart or uh, Austin Canoe and Kayak or REI and buy a kayak, they're thinking, great, look, I got a kayak. Look at this. This is something new. But it's like, no, this thing has been around <laughs> for thousands of years. And here we are today celebrating the enjoyment, but also the subsistence of kayaking. And several good writers have argued and made the point that kayaking started off as a hunting vehicle. Oh, no doubt. It was subsistence. Yeah, I mean, totally. they, were, they were hunting or fishing out of it. And so that's where it started. And then look at us today with our, our fancy hobies and pedaling and motorized. I mean, it's just such a continuous line of innovation over thousands of years. And I just don't know of any other sport 
or vehicle that could set, could make that claim. You know, I, I love my Hobie. And it's a, to me, it's, it's a fishing machine. But there is just something about the simplicity and the quiet and the tranquility of paddling a really nice, smooth paddling kayak. And the places that you can go and the things that you can see, you know, the, you, you don't disturb the wildlife. And the stuff that you can see out of that kayak and is just amazing. Well, and if you go back three or 4,000 years, you know, the Aleuts would get in their kayaks and they would uh, go hunting sea otter. And when they went hunt sea otter, the sea otters got smart and could see that a kayak was coming with a guy with a spear. And so the Aleuts developed these beautiful, long, sloping hats with brims that were like as much as a foot long in front of their forehead. And that's how they would disguise themselves when they were hunting for sea otters. So there's just no question the history of kayaking and people's use of kayaks is just remarkable. And brought all to present day, like you said, the technology is remarkable so that we can get out there like your recent podcast on BTB. Mm -hmm. The fact that I can now navigate the waves and get beyond the breakers with this technology is just remarkable. So we were talking about your, your next book and you were preparing for your next book. We had a conversation on the phone where you were going to do a little trip down the intercoastal. Have you made that trip yet? No, that's the last part. I, I for, for this next book, I want to do stuff on lakes. So I spent 10 days up on Toledo Bend. Just what's it like to be crossing, kayaking along the biggest lake in Texas? Mm-hmm. And then some friends and I went down the Devil's River. Yeah. And what's it like to go down a river? And of course, that's an incredible river. And then the time that we spent at Matagorda Island gave me some time on the coast, been down to um, Rockport, kayaked out of there. But the last one I want to do is from uh, Port Isabel up to Port Mansfield. And actually, one of your friends or mm-hmm. our people, a- uh, David, from the from the, the, the valley. Yeah, said you he, met him on the trip. I met him on the trip. So yeah. we're he's a police officer down mm-hmm. there. So we're planning on doing that trip from uh, once the weather calms down. But that's... a. Uh- yeah, because you, you told me on the phone that you are doing, the idea for the book was to spend 10 days on a lake, 10 days on a river, and then 10 days on, on salt water to give you the, the... Well, just, it really asked the question, what's the difference? Yeah. What's the difference of being on the coast? Well, dang, salt is... <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you, don't, if you don't appreciate the difference of being in a salty environment versus the river lakes, and then what's the difference of being on a river? Well, the river is in a channel. It's pushing you down. You don't... You know, it's, 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 it creates its own flow. Mm-hmm. And then the lake, remarkably, depending on which lake you're in, you know, it's there's like up until you'd have been there, alligators in that lake. And you've done several shows where you've talked about alligators. But when you're in a kayak in water with an alligator, holy poop. It's like it'll get, it'll get your attention. You're a lot more on his level, you know, <laughs> than you're not in a boat or anything like that. You're a lot more on his level. And it, it makes you think about it a little, even though they're not aggressive. But, uh, it makes you think about it. Oh, it, it, uh, I've, I've been up in Alaska, as you'd guess, uh, the number of years I've been up there, I've been in some wilderness parks doing mm-hmm. archaeology and have had some run ins with bears. Yeah. So, you know, you get talking about what's it like to be around a bear. Well, in Texas, what's it like to be around an alligator? Not only when you're on his level, but he is on your level. Yeah. You know, I can't imagine a bear. I mean, I've never had an encounter with a bear, don't know anything about him. But from what little knowledge I have, I'm thinking black bear is probably not that. He's not really out to have you for dinner. Yes, no, or no, that's right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. But, but you know, a grizzly bear, he's really probably not out to have you for dinner. But if he wants you, he's got you. <laughs> but but you know, let me let me just jump into that weeds for a second. Alligators have a certain psychology. And listening to your show, y'all talked about when and how. Why would an alligator mm-hmm. come out and pester you? And y'all talked about it a couple of podcasts ago where, you know, if you're close to the nest, if they're nesting, if there's eggs, they're going to come talk to you. Mm -hmm. That's the psychology of an alligator. Well, bears have the same thing. So one of the psychology of a bear, especially a grizzly, is that who is the biggest bear? So, you know, a lot of times when they're before they charge, they're going to stand sideways and show you how big they Mm -hmm. are. Well, one of the hacks that we use up in Alaska is that if your bear comes into camp we empty out our tent and we hold the tent above our heads and all of a sudden we're bigger than the bear. So that's a phrase that we use up in Alaska now is no matter what problem you're facing, just become bigger than the bear. (laughs) And hope he doesn't call your bluff. (laughs) I'm looking at the book here and this is what, you know how we sign off our podcast, every podcast. 
chapter number three, safety and first aid. Yeah. So you cover that right out of the right out of the, the box. I think in part because of listening to all your podcasts, I think you do a great job. And the, the, the quote that I like the most is that if you're not wearing your safety vest and you flip over, it's too late. Mm-hmm. You cannot put it on in the water. And you never know when trouble is going to find you. I mean, I, I experienced that myself. Thought I was wash, going to wash my hand off and just had leaned a little too far. And I'm in the water and I'm by myself. And, and, it, wasn't a, and it wasn't a good thing. And it just and you there was a little video I don't know if you saw it on uh, social media the other day one of our friends was coming in from BTB the waves were a little bigger than they thought and but he was enjoying riding the surfing the wave back in and it literally it didn't roll him side to side it picked him up from the back and flipped that kayak end over end wow water is like it's undefeated and we just don't I think appreciate enough how much power is in those waves. I mean, here on the Texas coast, we don't do a lot of surfing, but I played in the waves in Hawaii and that water, those waves will just act, you know, they'll just wreck your world. They, you have no control when you get picked up by a wave. It's going to do whatever it wants to do with you. But to your point earlier, that's one of the fun things about kayaks is I don't experience the power of water if I'm in a motorboat. No, correct. I, I power over it. I, you know, what, what's that called when you hit stride or you hit, uh, you're, you get up on step. Yep. Well, kayaking you you are with the water you are part of the water you know you become aware of to an extreme point the force of water and that whole the question about the difference between lake and river and ocean and you know it's just being part of water i think is one of the real special parts of being on a kayak you get to really feel the environment so i'm, I'm looking here at chapter number three safety and first aid notes you know and just here just give you an idea Every chapter has questions about that chapter to get you to think about what do you need and how would you implement this in your kayak fishing. Um, Name some reasons why you'd wear a personal flotation device. Uh, Do you have a newer one? Are you ready to wear it? What do you have for making noise, wearing bright colored clothing and or a light for other boaters or 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 other boaters to see you? You know, if you're you're launching pre-dawn, you need to have a light. You got it by Texas law. You have to have one. But what are you going to use? Are you going to use a flashlight taped to a pole? Maybe not the best thing. Are you going to are you going to DIY? Kayakers are great at doing DIY stuff, and you can go on social media and find that and find how to make a 360 white light for your kayak. Or you can buy. You know, you can go down to ACK or wherever and in, 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 in buy one. So it gives you some you know thoughts on how you want to solve that problem i think and that's the key in my mind what i hope for i should say in writing this book is that i wanted to get people to answer their own questions so i could go buy a book and he'll say get a 360 light well thank you now i didn't have to think did i but the question you just asked is like well what are you going to do what yeah. what are you going to do to solve this problem you know and i love the other there's a question here about communications what are you going to do about communications i think most of us think our phones the best communication it's not. It's not. Not on the water. Yeah. If you look over your left shoulder there on the desk, you'll see the two radios that I have. Mm-hmm. And I have come I have come to determine that I'm not going kayak fishing without my radios because it makes easier contact to whoever you're fishing with. And if somebody gets in trouble, the radio's right there and it's a lot easier to key up that radio than it is to try to dial a phone number on your phone. Well, not only that, but if you look at the other boaters then in the area, like when we on the Matagorda trip and we had that one little flip over in the mm-hmm. canal on the way back, if none of us had been there and that he had gotten in trouble, which he did not, he you know, y'all rescued him, mm-hmm. um, he could have with his radio contacted other boaters in the area. So very practical suggestion. So you know, but that's the thing I love about this book. Every chapter has got these questions. And it's like I said, it's not a big book. And you get to write. And here's just a thought that I had. You know, once you get, you know, some experience under your belt and you reread the book, I bet your answers are different. I totally believe. I think not only are your answers different, but what haunts me as a writer, I'll go ahead and disclose right now. <laughs> I'm not sure these are the best questions. I, like I said earlier, I researched the snot out of, you know, the topics mm-hmm. and what should I know. But really, if you get right down to it, it's hard to ask a good question. Mm-hmm. You know, so if the more experience you have, 
the more questions you have, they get better questions. And so what I, one of the things I like about listening to all the podcasts, you know, I've, I've so far found 15 different podcasts on kayak fishing across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, what's interesting to me is the, the oldest one is like started in 2018. I think you started in 2019. 29. I think there's one. Uh, what's the, he's in your book. It's in the book. But there's one. Uh, I think that's the oldest one. Bass Nation something. Mm. He's looking it up in the book. But just I to make that point, there's about 15 podcasts out there. And each one of them focus on a different water, a different uh, area, different region, different tournaments, and et cetera. But I find, as a writer, the toughest thing to do is to come up with great questions. And the people that he they've been interviewed on the podcast, sometimes they interviewed guides. And what's really cool is to hear the humility of guides saying, I've been doing this a long, long time, and I know that I don't know all there is to know. Yeah, and you, that's the thing I love about you know kayak fishing is you learn something every time you go out. Absolutely. It's never the exact same conditions. Um Sometimes the fish are cooperate. Sometimes they won't. You got to figure it out. Where are they at? Where are they? Where do they want to hit on? So it's a it's a learning experience. And I think when we, you know, both of us are we're not spring chickens, but uh, still learning is the is the is the I don't know the I would say the the spice to life. You know. It's, oh, it, it is. I mean, you couldn't go too far in that direction if you look at why we prepare kids in schools to learn. You know, the, the, the adage we like to say as educators is we're not, we don't see kids as empty vessels that we try to fill up. We try to set them on fire and get them excited about mm -hmm. learning. So shame on us if we just think, you know, you're empty and here's, I'll give you all this content about kayak. We want you to be excited about the experiences and learning and learning more and learning more and learning more. It's a lifelong thing, period. And what the other thing is that is interesting about kayaking, I can do it the rest of my life. How many you know, I might have played football in college or, mm -hmm. or high school, college. I can't do that when I'm 80, but I can play. I can kayak the rest of my life. What a sport! I have said on this podcast before. My goal is to be 80 years old and still putting the kayak in the water and going fishing. When well, since you're 29 now, <laughs> <laughs> we wish. We I actually have a birthday this week. Oh wow! But, Happy uh, birthday! Yeah. So uh, not a spring chicken anymore. So in your book, you have a chapter on glossary, on, on, I say glossary terms, fishing terms, right? So uh, let's talk about some of those glossary fishing terms. It's almost, you know, when we, we, you hear some of it, if you're not, if you're new to kayak, you might be, what the heck are they talking about? BTB would be a great example. I'm going to add it to the book, actually, <laughs> Beyond the Breakers. Y'all did a great podcast on that. And all that really means is, uh, our, one of our listeners from uh, California and he asked what it was. He goes, oh, we just call that beach launching here. And that's really, what, that's all it is. And for some reason, I guess, it's not, I don't think it's a Texan thing, but uh, we came up with the terminology BTB. But there's there's lots of other um, slang terms that are unique to kayak fishing. And when you get into kayak fishing, you might you, you hear these things and you're going, well, what the heck is that? And so you cover some of those in your book. I do. I was surprised because part of my research was I listened to all of these podcasts. Mm -hmm. I listened to all of the 15 at least once. And like the case of yours, I've listened to it multiple times. But every time I, I started listening, I realized there's a language and a culture around kayak fishing. So can I give you a, a mm -hmm. vocabulary test? Yes. You ready for the pop quiz? Um, the expression to turtle the kayak means what? It means you rolled it over. You flipped it over. Mm -hmm. What about throwing a slab? Throwing a slab. See, when I read the book, there were some of those things that I was like, I'm not sure. So if I was throwing a slab, maybe I was throwing a heavy lure or a big it. lure. That's it. That one that came, I think, from Pennsylvania. Okay. There's one in Tennessee. Um, CPR is a phrase that not a lot of people know. Catch, photo, release. And that has to do usually with an online tournament. Uh, you do an online kayak tournament, and that's the format that they use. You catch the fish, you take a photo of it on a prescribed measuring device, and then... You release the fish. Right. So then there's other expressions that are just unique to kayaking. I don't know how to put it, but there, there was a podcast doing an, uh, an interview with a fellow that won the tournament. And mm -hmm. the other person being interviewed was a person thinking about entering the tournament. And the guy who won the tournament said, it made, made this comment. He said, scared money don't make no money. 
<laughs> Can you? Well, how does? What does that mean? How would um, you, if you're not money? willing to invest in it, yeah, that's it. Yeah. In but other it, words, I might have to put up five hundred dollars to be in the tournament, and I don't know that I. Well, it's gambling. Mm-hmm. I mean, legal, but it's, it's like I'm not willing to bet five hundred money in the tournament winner. I said, look, scared money don't make no money. Isn't that a great expression? <laughs> it is. You know, we had this conversation on the last podcast with Roger, who's probably the most experienced kayak or experienced angler that we have in our little group. And we were talking about he didn't enter the side pots. And well, there, there's another term right there, right? What's a side pot? So usually in a, in a tournament, you have the main with the main category of the whatever the tournament is. And this one, it was a flounder tournament, so we were, we're fishing for flounder. But they have side pots: the biggest redfish, the biggest trout. And if uh, the biggest slam that somebody catches, which is another term. So uh, Roger caught the biggest trout, but he didn't enter the side pot. He's like, well, I'm not good at games of chance. In fact, in games of chance, it's zero chance for me because I never win anything. But to me, I told him, is it, but it, this is based upon your skill. So shouldn't you have confidence in your skill and enter the side pot? Yeah. <laughs> and that's, I think that's part of the culture of fishing tournaments. You know, they're, Fishing tournaments out of motorized boats is tremendously huge. I just, mm-hmm. I mean, it, you you could go on and on about how, but now that kayak fishing tournaments are coming, part of the culture of the kayak fishing tournaments borrow from the other bass fishing tournaments, but there are unique things about it as well. So one of the things that I learned about tournaments is that tournaments allow, um, here are two phrases in the vocabulary in the book, prospecting or pre-fishing. Pre-fishing, yeah. What does that mean? Well, I've never used the word prospecting, but I know what that would mean. Pre-fishing, we go out maybe the day before. It could be the week before and check out an area to see if it might be an area that we want to use during the tournament. Because obviously with kayakers, when you decide to, to fish an area, you're there. You're there. You, you're you, not firing up the motor and running, you know, five, ten miles somewhere else. You're there. So you got to fish that area. Exactly. And so here's the other expression that I'd, I'd heard in one of the podcasts about what happens to the fish in a lake in a tournament? And the expression was the sore lip tournament fish. <laughs> what does that mean? I guess that means they get caught a lot. They get caught a lot. Yeah. And so what does that do to you as a angler? Um, you know, in terms of if you're fishing in an area that's been pre-fished or prospected and now it's tournament day and those fish are looking at you going, I don't know. I don't, I've been here, done that. Yeah. I could see that it's certainly in the lake. Um, just the, the fishing that we do down on the coast. Those fish move around so much. Um, you might catch one that's been caught before, um, but you might not too. So, but I definitely do not like when we pre-fish this flounder tournament. We did not go fish. So we fished the day before the tournament, but we did not fish the area that we had targeted or had chosen for the tournament. We stayed out of there because we didn't want to go mess with the fish. We didn't want to give them sore lips, I guess. Yeah, and 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 if you think of fisheries i call them fisheries the lake the river the coast has a fishery the entire environment and you see how many people are beginning to fish there on motorized boats as well as kayaks it's harder and harder to get to those unique places those Mm -hmm. out of the way places and far and away one of the most common descriptions of why people kayak fish is they get to go where boats don't go they can't go they can't go yeah they can't go so uh that's that's a great thing that we love about, about the kayak thing. But we can go and we can do what other people can't. We don't need a boat ramp to launch, right? We can launch off the side of the road as long as it's we have access to wherever we're going to launch. So we were talking about the learning curve here. So you get a new kayak, and I have fished all my life. And when I got my first kayak, it was like I was starting all over again because – Fishing out of a kayak's a little different. I mean, yes, the fish are there, and but just getting your kayak set up and all that. So I had nobody there to show me how to to do this. So I had to learn, and this is what we were talking about. How as uh, as new kayakers do we learn? You know, there's we talked about the books, but I think this day and time, it's the social media, right? There. So if I want to learn something right now. Um, then I'm probably going to get on YouTube and look for a video or I'm going to search it on my phone and, and look for whatever I'm looking for to show me how to do it. Right. I would agree. I, I wrote a whole chapter about guides because it turns out I, 
I'm a personal believer in guides. I think guides are a great investment. They're not cheap, but they're a great investment. So like some friends and I went down to Rockport and I hadn't fished that area. So we hired a guide to take us out. And uh, up in uh, the hill country where I live now, I've gone out with guides on the Guadalupe and et cetera. I, they're just, and what's interesting to me is one, the benefit of a guide because they know the area, they know the fishery, they know that, 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 and they can teach you. So I think I, spending a day with a guide is a great investment period. And I talk a little bit about how do you know who is a good guide mm -hmm. versus not a good guide. And I find one of the keys of picking a guide is to listening to the questions that the guide asks you. Yeah, does he ask any questions? Exactly. If they're yeah. not asking you questions, just I'm your money. not sure. Exactly. So I'm not, I don't want to say anything negative about guides. I just ask the question, what questions is that guide asking you while you're handing over this money? And it's like me, Tarzan, and I'm going to show you how to fish. It's like, I don't think so. I don't want that kind of guide. I want a guide that... One guide I interviewed said, I get more thrill out of my clients catching fish than me catching fish. That's the guide I want to go with. Well, that's me right now. That's, you know, part of the, the thing why we do what we're doing now is I love to take other people fishing. I do not want to be a guide. I don't want the stress of taking your money and putting you on fish. But I love taking people fishing and showing them how to do it. Now, I've done it many, many times, and I love to do it. And I have more fun watching somebody else catch a fish i mean I'll, I'll point him in the direction go up there and catch I, I saw the fish up there go up there and catch him and i love watching it and watching it you know we talked about the youtube there is some great information some great videos some great um i would say producers but there's a different word that they use creators mm -hmm. out there on youtube and then there are some lousy ones yeah you know we were having that little side conversation there's some they don't give a whole lot of thought to, to why they're producing a video or why they're putting something out there. Well, and it gets into some other books that I've written around digital storytelling. Uh, I'm fascinated with stories. Mm -hmm. You know, what makes a good story? What, why, what makes a good movie? What makes a good book? What makes a good story? And to your point, if I have a GoPro and I have a kayak and I go fishing and I have it rigged so that you can see all of my fishing, it's just that's not very interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm not that excited about watching 14 hours of somebody on a lake <laughs> chasing tanks. You know, it's like uh, I've been there, done that. It's just not there's no story there. I think the key with a good story and the key behind making good video is asking the question, what if? Stephen King, the you know, writer, mm -hmm. said the two most powerful words in the English language are what if. So if what if you were on this lake, what would you be experiencing? So if you can be the eyes for other people, if you can use the technology in creative ways, you know, getting under the water and looking at the fish's perspective of what they're seeing as you're trying to slave them. Mm -hmm. um, and then also what is unique about this experience? It's not like, you know, I'm on Caddo Lake and... Caddo's the only natural lake in Texas. So what? I can read that in a book. But what about what's unique about being at Caddo? What about the the insects, the bugs, the fish, the whole environment, and making your story that way? So I would argue that storytelling. I guess to put it simple, I would study up a little bit on storytelling and what makes a good digital story. You know, in the podcast, but I when I listen to other podcasts, I love hearing. The little side stories mm -hmm. that go along with it. Totally. He kind of kind of glues it all together. The when I do a, a YouTube, and I'm doing less and less YouTube here lately, but I'm either telling the story, like our our Matagorda trip. I put those videos out just so everybody that went on the Matagorda trip could could see that and have something to to remember it by. Now, there's a lot of other people that like to watch it to see what we did, and then if I my other thought is. If I'm going to teach you something, if I could teach you something in the video, and our friend Kevin, he does an excellent job of doing this, uh, but if I could teach you something in the video, in the eight or 10 minutes of this video, you know, it just speeds up your learning curve. And to speaking to that, I, I want to talk just another, you talked about it earlier, the DIY, do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yep. One of the things that's unique about kayakers is their willingness to adopt technology to, to do different things with it. I mean, and you can go onto YouTube and find all kinds of things that they've done for creating a sunscreen, a sunshade with canvas over the top of the kayak. I mean, on and on and on. But as a digital storyteller, I'm also struck with how many kayak fishermen are using drones. Mm, yes. And I'd love to do a shout out 
<clears throat> to one of your members of the Salty Yak Pack over in Sweden, Alao oh. Johansson. I yeah. mentioned him in the book. But if you get a chance, go to YouTube and look up O L O W Johansson, J O N A S E N. Forgive me, Alao, if that's not right. But he's in Sweden and he makes videos of his kayak fishing in Sweden with drones. And boy, oh boy, are they wonderful to look at. So I'm interested in how kayak fisher people will start using drones more and more to document their experience. But part of it, you know, one of the classic things you do in movie making is you do what's called an establishment shot. You know, the first scene is the city of Chicago or the Everglades or whatever. But when you're doing your storytelling, you want to give people the context that this kayak fishing is going on, quote, an, an establishment shot. Mm -hmm. And Olau does a great job of that with his uh, the YouTube videos he puts together over in Sweden. The drones just give just a, a whole different view. I mean, the you know, the whole thing that obviously something is flying, but that whole overhead view is just uh, just amazing in the, in the shots that you can get doing that. I don't have a drone, but I don't know that I'll ever have one. But you talk about the technology, learning the technology. We talked about this. What we're recording on right now, when I started this podcast in 2019, I had really had no idea how to record a podcast, how to edit a podcast, how to publish a podcast. But uh, through through learning, through social media, through learning through my own mistakes, you know, we've got to where we are now. And uh, yeah. That's just part of it. But to go back to that drone just for a second. Mm-hmm. I predict, I used to work for Apple for a while, and I went way back um, in the 80s, I was got, to, got to go visit Apple uh, as an employee, and I met with one of the old hippies that was like one of the mm -hmm. gurus at Apple, and he said that, um, I asked him a question, how did Apple figure out what was the next thing to create? So this is not an official interview, this is just a side conversation with one of the early employees of Apple. He said we had the blob chart. I was like, what? He said, well, we knew that technology would be changing over time, and we knew that we wanted, for instance, to have the next thing in kitchens, mm -hmm. because kitchens are the most visited place in a house. So we thought, here's the refrigerator. How's the refrigerator going to evolve? Here's the microwave. How's it going to evolve? And other appliances in the kitchen, and where the two appliances started to merge, he said that was the blob, and we would create the technology that would be that blob. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. So I'm going to argue that kayaks and drones are about to blob. They're going. To, you're going to see ways to launch the drone from the kayak, to retrieve it, to use it in special ways, ways of powering the drone, and et cetera. And I'm kind of brainstorming, but I think that's what one of the innovations going to happen to kayaks is the more creative use of drones, mm -hmm. not only from a videography standpoint, but search and rescue yep. standpoint. They're not legal to go out and hunt for fish or to literally hunt with a drone the yes. same day you're hunting, but... I would just say drones are interesting. And in, in, in full disclosure, one of my other books of questions is about how, learning how to fly a drone. So I'll get you a copy. In, uh, in my real job, uh, we are learning how to implement drones uh, in our job. You know, whether we're looking for people, uh, our tech team has implemented drones where they can fly them inside houses and look inside of a house before I, you know, an officer has to actually turn that corner, what's around that corner. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting where that stuff is going. Well, and to go back to the kayaking, let's say we're down at Matagorda and all of a sudden we see we have a headwind. If I get the drone up there, we can pick a channel of getting back to the mainland based on what I can see with that drone, period. Or if somebody's missing, I could go look for them. Or just from the, the thrill, excitement of what a drone sees at 400 feet above the ground versus what I see. So now the story is a bird's eye view mm -hmm. of the 22 of us kayaking back. It's like I have a whole different video, period. And I think the one thing that every photographer, and I would argue storytellers, need to consider is what's unique about your story? What's special or unique? And I would advocate that drones are a way of creating a unique perspective. Let's uh, switch gears here a little bit, and let's talk about Alaska. <laughs> I find this uh, mildly interesting. So uh, you still have a uh, you still have a, a, a guide service up there? What do you have up in Alaska? I just have a kayak fishing business, so okay. I like to take people up who want to go up and go kayak fishing in, the, in southeast Alaska. A lot of people, it's hard to appreciate how huge Alaska is, and so I get into my larger-than-life 
descriptions of Alaska, but just a couple of little statistics. Alaska is two and a half times bigger than Texas. Mm -hmm. Texas has 29 million people in it. How many in Alaska? Two. Two people. No, two million, I was thinking. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, not only, but 700,000. 700,000, so wow. So visualize Texas, how tremendously big is it as a state, you know, and two and a half times bigger than that, and I've only got 700,000 people. Wow. So let that sink in in terms of, uh, we want to talk about wild. <laughs> we want to talk about no fences. We want to talk about no trespassing. Uh, something like 85% of the state is managed by the federal government in the form of national parks, fish and wildlife refuge, BLM, et cetera. So when you get to Alaska, it's huge and it's wild. And about 350,000 people live in Anchorage. So we like to say, come to Anchorage, you can see Alaska from there. <laughs> It's so different. So in Southeast Alaska, there's an island called Prince of Wales Island. It's mm -hmm. the third largest island in America. Less than 10,000 people live on it. It's got fantastic roads. So I created a kayak fishing business there with just the excuse of taking friends up and taking kayak fishing. So we were up there a couple of weeks ago with two um, friends of mine from the hill country, and we saw bears, we saw whales, we saw sea otters. I mean, it was just a fabulous time. So for Texans in particular, because I can, you know, been, been here, done that. Love Texas a lot. And I love Texans because they're such a friendly people. But when Texans go to Alaska and see how really, truly wild it is, they're just blown away. It, I would say it's on the bucket list, but I think it's like better than that. I'm, what, what are you doing next weekend? <laughs> I'm off next weekend. This is, this is my weekend to work, so I'm off next weekend. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but let me, let me offer this idea. If you think about the challenges that we face in the lower, we call it the lower 48, Texas, Florida, California, and getting onto fisheries, getting out the boat ramps, the, you know, I mean, Port O'Connor, you mm -hmm. know, you, you prepared us well for the Matagorda Island about getting across the intercoastal canal, about the boats there. I mean, if you go to Port O'Connor and appreciate how many people fish out of Port O'Connor, you're going, wow, even though this is very remote part of Texas, kayaking from here is not easy, mm -hmm. in part because I'm competing with other motorized boats. You go to Alaska, nobody, nobody there, you know, <laughs> just you and the bears. And so uh, when you talk about fishing in Alaska, you're really talking about 10 times the more natural experience that we experience here in Texas. And I think that's what's unique about Alaska is that just how absolutely quickly you get into wild stuff. Wow. And there's just nobody there but critters. Absolutely amazing. Mark, what else you want to tell us about the book? Well, I think in the end, I just want to thank you for letting me come and talk about it. Um, again, of the 27 kayak fishing books that I came across, they're very, very well done. But in the end, it, was, it always answers. It was always answers, answers, answers. And what I like, about the idea of the books that I'm writing is that I'm just offering questions so that you have to figure out your own answer. And like I said, you know, the 15 topics in the book, I hope, cover what I ought to be thinking about. But I'm open to the idea that there's a 16th or 17th category. So I welcome feedback and uh, also welcome vocabulary. <laughs> so like I'm going to be adding BTB to it based on your last podcast. So I just hope people will keep giving me feedback to make the book better, better. And I hope that at some point you and I can do a workshop for the pack somewhere in Houston, Austin, so that we can actually get together and get that all these experts together in the same room or out on a parking lot and say, what is it that we know that we could add to the book to make it a better beginner and intermediate guide? I mean, like I've told you before, I am all down for that. So if I want to buy the book, where can I buy the book? Well, Amazon. Um, just look it up on Amazon under my name or the book. And now it's in uh, REI in uh, Austin, Houston, Florida. So if more and more REI stars are picking it up. And then that's where I'd go for now. I'd go to Amazon or REI. Could be at your doorstep in two days. <laughs> Fishing on Kayaks, a book of question. Mark Stanley, Ph.D. I didn't ask. What's the Ph.D.? English? Education. Education. Yeah. There we go. Mark Thank you so much for stopping by and being on the podcast. And I'm looking forward to going fishing again and getting you back on here. And going to Alaska. Oh, the, so, oh it's on my I just need to get the permission from the wife. <laughs> so uh, it's on the list. No, thanks. It's a real honor to be here with you. And as we always say, ladies and gentlemen, 
Always wear your life jacket. Somebody out there loves you, and we want everybody to come home. All right, we'll talk to you later.